So welcome everybody to our first uh, the series of Zoom webinars we're gonna have. So the idea is that we're going to invite uh, people to give talks, but instead of, they can give a talk if they want, but if, if they prefer, we'll ask them questions and they can show, they can, if they want, show slides or not. Uh, the idea is to continue our seminar that we had when we weren't in, in staying, staying at home uh, so everybody can uh, keep, keep, uh, keep updated with what's going on in the data science world. So our first uh, guest is Jeff Leak, who is, um, who I just got the news that won the Spiegelman Award. Let me put this on. Thanks, man. I appreciate the cheers. So the Spiegelman Award, for those that you don't know, goes to a statistician under 40 that has, um, that has done work in public health and it's given out by the American Applied uh, Public Health Statistics Section. So congratulations, Jeff, on that honor. Thank you, I appreciate it. Okay, so Jeff is a professor at Johns Hopkins uh, School of Public Health Department of Biostatistics. He's worked on genomics, but he's more recently, he has been working on developing material courses, programs to help teach data science. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, so, are you ready to go, Jeff? Anything else you wanna say? No, I think that's a pretty good start. I've taken your advice seriously, and I have a few slides prepared here and there, but my plan is to just make this a conversation. So hopefully that goes okay. Hopefully, okay. Uh, yeah. Good, and it should be about maybe 15 to 30 minutes if um, if it all goes as planned. Okay, so I'm gonna start by asking you what your definition is of data science, as we're, we're talking about data science education, and how do you distinguish it from statistics or biostatistics? Yeah, I know that this is a bit of a loaded question because of the person asking the question. So, uh, but yeah, I, I would say that the, the reason why data science sort of seems to exist, or at least appears to exist for me, is that Statistics and biostatistics as disciplines had this nugget of something that was extremely valuable that they were doing, which is sort of solving applied data problems with uh, statistical ideas, but also with computational ideas. But it was sort of a secondary feature of those programs. And so, uh, but it turns out that was super duper valuable. And once companies started collecting tons of data, they, it kind of exploded, you know, that, that the demand for that skill set became really important. And so there wasn't really a name for it because it was a secondary component of most stats and biostats departments. And so it needed a name and, and the name that landed on it was data science. But I think a lot of people who are already doing that kind of stuff in stats and biostats departments would have called themselves, you know, would say that data science is just what they were always doing. Um, and now there's like a label on it. So I think it's the part of applied statistics that's like, solving a problem with data and that might include everything from collecting the data and synthesizing it and organizing it to making sure it's the right question you're answering to applying a new method sort of that whole process from question to answer is what i call data science and you know you could also call it applied statistics a lot of people would call it that too um, but i think that it needed a name because there was so much demand for it and it was sort of treated as a second class citizen in a lot of departments yeah, so you're talking about an academia, yeah. So yeah. I, I, that's pretty close to what I, how I think about it. The, the, maybe one distinction I would make from what you said is that there's a lot of people that are part of the data science process that aren't statisticians and they're, they're yeah. more involved in the part of organizing data, of making access to data efficient, making the, the software that we use to analyze data more efficient, et cetera. But yeah, but other than that, I think we agree on, on and why that term exists. And a lot of what is called data science is in fact applied statistics. Not all of it, but a, but, but a lot. Good. Yeah, and I do think that there's other people that are, you know, I, I've been focusing on stats because that's where I live as an academic statistician, but there's definitely a huge group of people that all kind of were nipping at the edges of this thing, but there was never a place, a, a central word for like, what is it the per people that do that, that question solving with data? What's their name? Yeah. So, so with that in mind and how, how important you, you seem to be implying data sciences today, we have, what we have these PhD programs that have trained a lot of people who are currently very successful data scientists, 
Uh, do you, I, I suspect you think that we should change them a bit, maybe not. So I'll let you answer that. Do you think our, stati our, our PhD programs are fine as they are, or we should be changing something? What should we add? What should we take out? Yeah, I think this one is a really hard one is academics. You know, it's the same kind of tradition that happens in a lot of academic, you know, like this is how I was taught. So therefore it must be the right way to teach the next generation of people. And I think that that, you know, serves well in the sense that you don't want to wildly chase every, you know, trend that's out there. On the other hand, I think that there's some big changes that have happened to our field over the last few years. And I do think we should adapt to them. The main thing I think we should do is be more flexible. So one of the things that like, for example, I'll only pick on our own, my own department because it's not really fair for me to pick on other people. So in our, in our department, we have so, sort of three sort of main classes that people have to take in our PhD program. There's a theory class, a methods class, which is also pretty heavily mathematical, and then a probability class, which is also like a heavy duty math. And then there's a data science course, but it's sort of in the second year and it isn't part of the main core curriculum of courses. And so um, it sort of feels like it's a second class citizen to the main, the main component, which is like heavy duty math. But the, you know, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think our students should know, you know, some probability and they should know theoretical statistics, at least the basics, and they should know, you know, methodological development, certainly. But the program is designed such that there's no room for version control and you know reproducible research and how do you ma manipulate big data sets and how do you think about exploratory data analysis in like a really deep thoughtful structured way um and you know we're adding that in as everybody is we're kind of cobbling it into different parts but i feel like it should be its own sort of piece in the curriculum and you know it's easy to say let's add things to the curriculum because that's the you know the default is like let's just keep adding things forever to curricula and they'll get huge so the hard thing is to decide what you leave out. And so I think the argument I've been sort of making internally for a little while is that we should um, have a, sort of either a track system or a more flexible system where maybe there's five main PhD courses, a couple of them applied, a couple of them theoretical, and one of them kind of in the middle that everybody takes. And then students that come in can kind of pick their track to match their interests, their research, their ultimate research interests a little bit more closely. Um, and so I would give up, you know, for our really applied students who want to go in and do data science, maybe they don't need to prove a ton of theorems about with measure theory, but they maybe need to be really good at computing. So maybe they spend more time on computing and they drop some probability. So I, I think I would, I would add in more analysis, more computing. I would reduce probably for the applied people, the, the theory and the, and the probability. But those people are also really, like theory and probability are also really important to our field. So those should exist too, but you know, it should be a separate track that's sort of equally weighted in, in my opinion. Right, yeah. So I mean, that's not, that's not impossible to do and I think some programs are doing it. Yeah, I think they are, yeah. I think people are moving in that direction. I mean, it's the writings on the wall in terms of like, we need you know, data science capability, so. Yeah. And, but yeah, the one thing I would say to those listening that are de designing PhD programs is that you need to, you got to accept the fact that you got to get rid of stuff if you want to add new things because graduate students are already up to the gills in, in work. So you can't, you know, it's just not realistic to keep adding, which is, uh, seems to be the first instinct of many in the field. Would you agree? Yeah, I think that's always, it's always the harder question. What do you give up? And I think the problem is, right, there's probably a ton of data science stuff I wish all our PhD students would learn, but I'm going to have to give up some of that to have them be a broad-minded statistician. Similarly, on the sort of theory side, somebody, one of my colleagues who's really theoretical is going to have to give up something that they think is fundamental in theory that, that, that our students won't learn because they have to learn this data science stuff. So there's got to have to be compromise there, and that's hard. Compromise is hard, but it's the only way to like really make it flexible for the students. Yeah, but are you, you think we're there? I don't think we're there, but what about you? Do you think we're there? Like, are we there in terms of are we doing this, right? So we this, have right? a program that, that a PhD program that, that produces people who, who can do applied statistics and they learn everything they need to learn in the program. I feel like most of us learn a lot of what we do today after we graduated in practice. 
I think that's I think that's still kind of the steady state. I think departments are trying really hard to add this in, and you know I wouldn't want to discredit people who are putting a huge amount of effort into doing that. But I don't think we're there yet. Like I think people, most of the students that say come and work on really applied problems with me, you know, it's I have a lot of stuff that we have to practice up, and and that they didn't get in the core curriculum that I wish they did, so that by the time they got to no, me, but, I wouldn't. But have to I would say that's that okay because they yeah, got yeah. to you and you you train them. But yeah, sure. It, could, it would be easier for you and less time for them if, if they had already learned it. All right. Sure. So that's good. Good. Uh, interesting answers. So you, you're, let's talk about the online stuff. So, so you're one of the co-creators of this Coursera data science specialization that's uh, quite popular. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so uh, a few years ago, um, I was a, a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed assistant professor and uh, got approached about teaching a class on this online platform called Coursera, which at the time, nobody had really heard of. It was really brand new. Uh, Daphne Kohler and uh, Andrew uh, Yang had, had, had just, um, not Andrew Yang, uh, Andrew Yang had just uh, founded it. And so it was just like very fresh and they wanted more content on it. So they asked me and a couple other faculty who were just kind of in the halls, we have to round out this course sequence for, um, for Coursera because Hopkins wanted to be a founding partner. To be a founding partner, you had to have so many courses. So we said, yes, we teach some classes. So our, our friends signed up for it, me and Roger Pang and Brian Caffo. So they teach these two classes and they get like 50,000 people enrolled and it was pretty, bananas because we thought maybe like a thousand people would enroll in these classes. No one had any idea these numbers would start happening like this. So then I teach my class and it was a hundred thousand people in it and it was crazy. Like every crazy thing happened. I put a data set on our department's web server that we hosted ourselves and all hundred thousand people hit it at once and like crashed our department's website. Like all sorts of weird stuff like that happened. So then, uh, um, about, uh, you know, a couple of months after we taught that course, uh, Daphne Kohler came to visit Hopkins because our courses were kind of the popular ones and she said look we're trying to put together programs on our platform do you have a data science program so this was January 2014 and we said yes we totally have a data science program to put up on there which we absolutely didn't we hadn't put together any of it we had no sort of structure or anything so she said great we're launching in April so we had between January and April to like put together this data science program and so what we did was we had kind of for a while been a little bit frustrated about some of the missing applied components in our local program at Hopkins. It's kind of hard to get them into our master's program, hard to get them into the PhD program um, for lots of reasons. And uh, so we just, the beautiful thing about Coursera was we had total flexibility. We could design the program however we wanted, you know, like there's nobody looking over her shoulder. Nobody was even paying attention. So we sat down and had a really serious conversation around what is the full structure of what does it look like to go from question to answer in data science. And so we designed a whole program that's this 10 course sequence that goes everything. And we put some courses that I think at the time were a little bit more unique, like getting data and reproducible research and building data apps with Shiny and APIs and things like that. So those, those were at the time, 2014, kind of rare to find in local programs. And so we put our program on the internet and then because Frankly, because it was the only data science program you could take online, it exploded in pop. You know, it was like just great sense that is the data science program you could really take online. Data science was in the New York Times; it was all over the place, and so we had you know just millions of people enroll in the in the program. And so it was it was pretty exciting, um, but largely I would say you know luck in terms of timing. We were just like lucky to be at the time at the right time. Yeah. Not all luck, but yeah. So yeah. I have a, I just realized there's questions. I'm going to, oh, uh, I'm going to wait because these were, these questions that are up here right now are related to the first set of things we discussed and I will, I will uh, get to them at the end, but right now I just want to keep going and, but please ask questions. I'm looking at it. That's why you're going to see my eyes looking to the side. If there's a question about what we're talking about now, I'll, I'll, I'll ask it right away if it's appropriate though. Okay, so um, so yeah, the, the question right now is if there's anybody interested in, in uh, starting a GoFundMe to get you a new camera. I think I'm on, I'm on a Chromebook, which I was just replying. You'll hear more about that here, I think, in just a minute. So okay. yeah. So all right. So the, now let's you 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 teach these courses. People take them, but do we know that they actually work? What's the empirical evidence that these 
courses do anything anything good? Do people learn? Do people get jobs? What What do you have? To yeah, say? so that was one of the things we. I, I ended up hiring a postdoc who was an economist to basically study this problem because we didn't know what was going on. You know, we had there's pretty good evidence that you know programs in general, like college programs, uh, you know, graduate programs, are uh, produce improvement and people's earning income and, and all that sort of thing. And so we ended up performing, you know, it's, you can't really randomize people to take the program and not take the program. So we had to perform sort of a, a retrospective study. We did a survey and we asked people about their pre-data science uh, program income and their post-data science income. We then compared, we asked them a bunch of other questions that were also automatically collected by the platform so we could sort of validate the responses and things like that. And then we used, you know, statistical techniques to try to estimate the sort of causal impact of taking a, you know, our data science program. And so, you know, with, you know, you may or may not believe those sort of causal techniques and whether they apply to a retrospective survey of data, but this sort of, even without those sort of techniques, there's sort of pretty consistent evidence that people who took the program before and after, they would have a pretty big bump in income. So I'm going to just, I'm going to see if I can share my screen really quick here. Um, let me see if you all can see this. Can you see my screen? Yep. I okay. See it. Okay. So I'm going to just show you a quick plot. This is so this is data from the from that survey, and so you can see on the x-axis here, this is the income people reported before Coursera Data Science, and on the y-axis is income they reported after. And so you can see that like sort of consistently, people report incomes that are higher after. And there's a whole bunch of confounding factors that I could talk about, like people get more education, and there's a time bias, et cetera, et cetera. We tried to correct for as much of that as possible. Um, but on average, you sort of see that people make, you know, the dots are mostly above the line. People make more money after than before. These dots down here at the bottom, I don't know if you can see my arrow here, but these dots down at the bottom uh, represent how bad we are at, at, you know, how bad for people we are, like before they were making, you know, a bunch of money, and then now they're nothing so that's a bummer but the people that were really inspiring to us is this sort of corner up here that I'm highlighting green so this is like people who were effectively making either no money or very very little money before they took the Coursera data science and then afterwards they were making above what, what we would call the 80th percentile of income in the US and so that was sort of an, an, a very tiny fraction of the people that took our course but a really inspiring fraction of the of the people because the program itself is more expensive now than it used to be but it's overall about $1,000 to complete the program. And if you can bump your income quite a bit like that, um, it, it would be sort of an impressive uh, piece of educational infrastructure. So that was an inspiring fraction that we have launched like a whole new research enterprise around how can we manufacture that kind of success for people um, now that now that we know that that's possible oh, with these online All right, classes. good. So this is, this, you showed us money, but now about uh, doing, you know, learning to, to do it properly is what my next question is. And there's a question on, from the, one of the attendees that's related. So I'll ask both at the same time. So what they're, the question that someone is asking is that, uh, is what would you say is a set of intro topics one would need before taking Data Science 101? Or does Data Science 101 become just learning how to use different R packages? And the question that I was going to ask, which is a little bit related, is that if you worry that that we're we're training people to to manipulate, wrangle, and make plots, which can get them a job, but then they're not really trained to understand statistical concepts in a way that they can actually analyze data correctly. You know, one of, one of the things I like about stats is that it, about the stats is that you see a whole history of mistakes and of of of, of ways we can screw up. We see, we also see methods that have been developed, so it keeps us from reinventing the wheel. And if, you know, in a short program, you might not see all that. So I'll, I'll, I'll let you answer those questions. Yeah, so I think that's something I have to, given the insanity of all the data analysis that we've seen over the last few months with the COVID thing is something I've been spending a lot of nights like laying up sweating, thinking about. Um, so I think that there's two parts to that answer. One is, I think, and I think a lot of people believe this, that actually a smoother introduction to people to seeing, in other words, if you kind of can get data in and look at data and make plots of data, that's like less intimidating than trying to figure out statistical inference, which is a pretty big sandwich to eat. You know, like it's pretty difficult to figure out stats inference. Whereas I think these R packages make like loading in some data and making some plots like way easier than it was a few years ago. And so 
I think flipping, I would almost say before I even started thinking about stats, I would introduce people to, you know, how do you get data in? How do you look at data? How do you visualize it? How do you start to see patterns in it and things like that? And then the other piece is, so one thing that is really interesting that you brought that up is, so we, we have this Coursera sequence and one of the courses in it, I feel bad, our buddy Brian Caffo got stuck with this. He teaches the stats inference part of our Coursera sequence. And that is the class, like it's the least fun class to teach in the whole sequence, right? Like the whole sequence is like getting data in and doing fun stuff with it or machine learning or doing all this cool stuff. And then we have one class where we're like, this is how you be really thoughtful about inference, right? <laughs> and it is tough because like you're spending all this time learning our packages. And now you got to learn some stats. And so we lose a lot of people out of our program. So the program makes quite a bit of money because it's like a huge program, tons of people taking it. And it would make even more money if we dropped the stats inference class because like way fewer people would drop out of the program. They'd just like cruise through it. But we think it's really important that people know the basics of statistical inference because if not, just like you said, Rafa, they're going to like know how to manipulate stuff but not have no idea what's like, you know, a standard error versus not, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've insisted, like despite many, many objections from, from the financial side of an enterprise to, on keeping stats inference in there because it's so important for people to learn that part about data science. But we don't teach it until like the sixth or seventh course. Like you've already done tons of data before you even look at a mm -hmm. standard error or a confidence interval or anything. So by then, you're at least comfortable manipulating things and looking at plots and stuff. So when we show you a plot with a regression line on it, you know what that is. You've seen it before. Maybe you don't know what the line means yet, but you, you know what the plot is. So I think it's super important. I think if anything, this sort of you've seen a million dashboards get launched, some which are good, some which are bad, and it's hard to judge the difference. So it's maybe emphasized even more that I think stats inference is critical, like inferential thinking at the minimum. But I would almost do it in the reverse order. I would do, I'd learn some data science, then I'd learn some stats, but I would not skip the stats part because that's how you get dangerous, in my opinion. You'd like, mm -hmm. you know, you miss that history of what are the important things to know how to do. So I just reorder yeah. it. Yeah, definitely yeah. Le learning. It's something that not just in stats, but in math in general, we, when we teach, we go today, we go straight to the abstraction rather than explain why it is that we're doing what we're doing. Why are we, you know, the fact that you, you learn calculus, never necessarily knowing that somebody wanted to calculate the, the speed of a ball going down a ramp. It's right. It's kind of crazy. But in, in stats, we do similar things. Okay, good. So, but, and what you're saying is that you want to see the data first. You want to see the problems. You want to you want to get stuck on something before learning how how what what more complex things you need to learn to get yourself unstuck. Right. Uh, okay. Good. So there's one question related to your your comment about the the price going up. Is yeah. there is a participation change when you did that? Yeah. I you know the the participation has gone down. Like we used to have these like incredibly high numbers every month you know we would get hundreds of thousands of people a month in each of the classes um and that lasted for a year a year and a half and then as the price has steadily gone up you know it's it's less and less people that are able to take the courses people audit the courses you can audit them for free but you know getting the certificate is no longer free like it was back in the you know there wasn't that option like there was back in the beginning and there's lots of financial aid and all sorts of you know there's all the pieces they're trying to do to put you know to make it affordable for people um, and it still is compared to a master's program or something, it's dramatically cheaper, but it is getting more expensive. And as it gets more expensive, you lose, you lose the big gaudy numbers. You don't see the hundred thousand people a month type thing anymore in the program, mm -hmm. which frankly is probably a little bit easier on us, the instructors, because that's like a pretty heavy duty load um, on an instructor. If you're getting those kind of numbers to the program, so a little bit easier for the instructors. Um, but I don't know. So there's part of me that thinks that these things should be free for everyone. And then there's part of me that realizes that, you know, we have to pay to produce them and maintain them. And, you know, there's a bunch of people that run these courses. Yeah, sure. They've got to get, they've got to earn money somehow. So I feel like if we can make the price not be something you have to take out a loan for, it's, you know, it's, uh, you know, not, not free, but it's not a horrible price, you know. We make all of our books and content free, though, so people can get access to those. Good. So now that plot you put up there, you, we saw some pretty, those, especially those highlighted green points, that was quite dramatic. So I, I guess when you saw that, you had, you had another inspiration that there's an inefficiency in the market, that there's all these people willing and able to learn things that they can't afford or they don't want to necessarily invest right away. So 
you, you seem to have seen that and um, so it's okay for master's degrees so. That's a kind of a, that's a that question, the most loaded possible version of that question. I wouldn't say that people are overpaying for master's degrees. I would say that the big thing is that the, the data science is more than one thing, and it's, um, it hasn't, the, the sort of formal structure for how a data science, you know, department or program at a company should look hasn't really, you know, hasn't been formalized yet. So let me give you an example of this. We, as part of this, and I'll tell you maybe more about this later in a minute, we had to, we formed a data science consulting company that hires some of the program graduates of another program we created. And that data science consulting company works with a bunch of different companies around the country. And they have all sorts of needs. Everything from, we have a bunch of Excel workbooks that are like a hot mess and we need them sort of sorted out in a way that we can make sense of. Two, we want to try to fit a, you know, convolutional neural network to try to make a prediction about what our customer is going to do next month. So there's sort of a, you know, everything from like really what I would call blue collar work all the way up to like the most intellectual hard stuff you would be running into at a university. Mm -hmm. So the problem is most companies hire the same person to do that whole mm -hmm. job. They say, we want one person and they should do that whole job. And it's madness because if you got the person you hired, that's got like a PhD from MIT or Harvard or Johns Hopkins like what separating what what was that third? Uh, you know the top data science uh, <laughs> department in the country johns hopkins biostat <laughs> i can't believe i said that all right so the, we can delete that out of the recording right <laughs> um so yeah so uh yeah anyway so if you have this fancy degree and you're really really smart and you can do all these really complicated things but you're spending like 80 percent of the hours at work getting paid like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, just like removing commas from files and getting this Excel workbook to match that Excel workbook. Yeah, I think you're overpaying that. I think that's crazy to spend all that money on that person to do that. What you'd rather do is hire one or two people who know how to do that low level stuff at a much lower salary, but still a good salary. Have them put everything together and get it all nice. And then have the person with the super skill set spend all their time thinking about how to do things right with the, you know, at the high level. In most places, I think that's a great. I think that's a great insight, Jeff. I I, I have it. I, I I give you props for having that insight. It's not. It, it's definitely. I'm convinced of that. And now, and I see that you you seem to have used that insight to develop this new program where you're trying to get uh, people who are um, don't know anything and currently are unemployed, trying to get them trained and and get these these types of jobs. So you want to tell us a little bit about that. Um, yeah, so the, so basically what happens, we saw that data, the, the data that some people could like go from basically what we would call, we, the, what cutoffs we use is below poverty level income and to the 80th percentile in income in the U.S. And so we saw people that could make that leap using just an online program. We thought this is amazing. We should see if we can replicate that as a social, social mobility, economic mobility, um, activity. And so what we did was we built a new program. It's called cloud-based data science. It's on a different platform. It's on this lean pub platform where we can allow people to pay what they want. So they can pay zero or they can pay us some to help us sort of support the program. But that means that everybody can afford to do it no matter how much money they make. And we made it so that you could do the entire program through a web browser. So you can do it any computer, like you go to the public library and complete the whole data science program. We do it on Chromebooks, which is why my webcam is so bad. I saw the thanks for the, I appreciate the GoFundMe, but I've been like dog fooding using my own Chromebook. I've, I haven't used any laptop but a Chromebook for the last three years. Um, and so um, it's to teach myself to like, how do I do all this stuff if I don't have like a good laptop, if I don't have a computer that's like a MacBook Pro, how do you actually do all this work? So anyway, so we, we built this program, then we partnered with nonprofits in East Baltimore who do GED training and sort of entry level sort of educational training. And we put them, put people through this data science training program. We pay them a small stipend to complete each course they complete, they earn a little stipend and we sort of have them complete the whole program. And then we tried to get them those entry level data science jobs. And so the, that program, that cloud-based data science program has been running in Baltimore for about a year and a half now. We've kind of been doing it and pilot mode, we for it to people, sort of scaling it up. Um, and it works really well. Like they learn those entry level skills. How do you manipulate data sets? How do you, you know, we get people in our program who've never heard of data science before. 
not even like a little bit. They haven't even had an inkling of data science. And they come in our program and by the end, they're like pulling data off of BigQuery and like organizing it with dplyr and tidyr and like making ggplots. And they're doing all that sort of at the end of this three month program. And then we originally had planned on getting them hired directly into companies to do this entry level work. But the problem is I think just like with the data science program a little while ago, we're a little ahead of the market in the, sense, in the sense of like, I think companies are going to find this out over the next five to 10 years that they're going to need to have these different levels of data scientists, everybody from the entry level data cleaners up to the fancy pants AI people. And uh, they haven't done it yet. And so there weren't as many entry level data science jobs as I had kind of hoped. And so that kind of caused a problem for us because we had trained all these people, but there wasn't a place for them to go. So I created a company To hire a company contracts with the they give them and we can advice on these people that they've already worked with that are really good, and they can often, you know, like they're they're making good money, but they're not making like ridiculous over the top money, you know, in terms of and uh, so what it is is sort of a social mobility where you to stacking credentials. So you finish our program. Then you get an associate, uh, associate's degree, you, you reduce your time to an associate's degree at a local community college, then you can kind of go to college and, and move up the ladder. So we're kind of building this infrastructure. Uh, outreach from a bunch of different cities about doing this, and the two pieces that have got us kind of slowing down about doing that are, one, you need, you know, this hiring part is really hard to execute if you don't have a bunch of companies that were appealing to considering expanding to places where that already exists. Like we wouldn't have, if I had known in advance how hard it was going to be to generate the jobs, which are definitely needed, but companies haven't figured it out yet. If I had sort of known that that was going to be that hard, I might've been too scared to even do the program. So in the next, Second site, I would want to anybody here listening wants to hire somebody from your who wants to get these services. What do they do? Yeah, so they can contact me and I can have them, you know, they can either work directly with our or we have a few people that have like amazing programs on a condition. So we have a few people that could we could um, put into um, companies right now if the people are interested in companies or research groups or whatever. At Hopkins, we actually worked with the HR. Team over a period of a year, entry scientific HR specific applications. And we can send that to your HR team too if you wanted to Great. say Thanks. set it up. So your place. that's half an hour. I'm going to stop asking you questions. I do have a few from the audience, so I'm going to take a couple and then we'll finish. Is Sounds that okay, great. Jeff? Yeah. So there's one here that says. And I find a bind of uh yeah so a quick shot yeah that's tough uh and i think there's smart people working on that like i would um mine set and kai rundle and jenny bryan and um tiffany timbers there's a bunch of really smart people doing this so i'm actually probably not the most qualified to, to answer this but i'll try um i would definitely start with um integrating an undergraduate program with the application areas like if i was starting an undergrad data science program from statch i would not do it solely in one department i would base it in some department and then have significant fractions of the coursework be extenders into other departments like, you know, sociology, mm -hmm. physics, Berkeley's you know, doing uh, that. biology. Yeah. I think they're doing it really smart there. I think that's a really, you know, cause you want it to be, people really get excited about data science. They can use like some people like me are nerds and they love just data. Right. But a lot of people who aren't just into data, are really excited about using data to answer real questions. So if you can kind of merge those two things, and then I would try to get them to their wins as fast as possible. So I would teach them data manipulation and um, visualization and data apps even, like interactive apps, before I even started teaching them stats inference. And then I'd teach them that towards the end of the program and get them prepped for things like if they wanted to go to academics or if they wanted to go be in a higher role in industry. 
All right, here's another good one. What are the what are those data science capabilities that you would expect from your team in terms of what you call quote unquote more flexibility? Yes. I think one thing that's tricky about science is like I still I have no idea how to teach this. There's there's some people that when they run into an error on Google or whatever. just can figure out to get that they mess around with it enough and it comes up all the time in data science. But if you have that skill, it makes it a lot easier because most, at least of the company that we have and Every data science problem is just different enough that you're not going to know all the answers when you start and you're going to have to learn like 50% of it as you go. And so if you've got that skill, that flexibility of mind, and then the kind of determination to figure it out, you can get, you, you can solve a lot of problems for, you know, yourself and for other people. So I, we look for that, that skill or that ability when we hire people or we try to recruit people. Um, but it's hard to teach. Interesting. So here's one. Uh that is a little controversial. It's asking you, well, th this is a person who tried to develop a data science class and he used R and it was, can it was, it wasn't, he wasn't reject, the class was rejected because data science is done in Python. Um, and there's a, a sad face. So you, um, you use R, right? In your course? Yeah, so Exclusively? I- Exclusively? We, well, we teach them some SQL and things like that. Like they have to know how to get data in and out and they learn a little bit of like CSS and HTML so they can scrape things off the web, you know, like a few other things, but mostly it's R. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about that. So there's, there's the part of me that's like both languages can solve most of the problems you need to solve, including in production these days. I've seen like R used in heavy hardcore production pipelines. Mm -hmm especially with Docker and stuff like that, it's totally possible. At the same time, there is this sort of cultural thing that most companies are composed of people who write, like if you're in a software engineering company, almost everyone writes some Python. And so if you come in with R, you're kind of the odd person out in the sense that they don't speak your language and you don't speak their language. So it kind of makes it a little harder to work with them. So we've had one or two projects at our company where we've like lost the work because we couldn't do it in Python and they wanted to integrate it into their Python system. So, you know, the honest assessment is probably culturally in industry, Python is probably a better bet. Um, practically in reality, both languages work just fine to do data science. So it kind of, I don't know. I, I sometimes think we should do the whole thing over in Python, but I've, I don't know if I've got the bandwidth to build another get another data science program. Well, I, I, I still think R is the best language for data exploration, which is an important part of data science. Python seems much better for production, sure, but if you're still exploring and, and building proto, uh, prototypes, I, I mean, it's, I think it's-, it's I agree, I think- Flexible, the, pl the, pl the plotting system is, 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 is easier to use, it's much, quicker from idea to plot and, and from plot to improvement of what you're doing. I have to say, I think R is actually, R is actually better in a lot of respects like that. Like shiny apps are way easier to build. There's an equivalent thing for Python. It's not nearly as good as like shiny is incredibly good for building, like standing up like a web application based on data. It's sort of amazing actually. And then the same thing for like dplyr and ggplot2 and, and then the big infrastructure of packages like on really specific things like bioconductor, which are really kind of incredible. I think it is better for data analysis. You know, and this goes to a lot of companies are trying to do data engineering, well, not I, data analysis and data I would science. be more specific. I would, say for, I would say for interactive data analysis, the R has sure. no equal. Yeah. Sure. Because once you know what you have to do, no, you're just writing a pipeline and other languages right. are more efficient. All right, well, great, Jeff. This has been fun. I hope it was fun too. I'm yeah. sorry to all the people who have, um, that I didn't, we didn't answer, but I promise half an hour and we're, we're over. So um, our next guest is gonna be Natalie Dean, who is an expert in infectious diseases. So you can imagine why we why invited her.
then after that, uh, we have a couple of other uh, people lined up, which I don't know exactly the dates yet, but keep an eye out for our um, Twitter handle, which, which we're, we'll be making all since DFCI data science. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Anything else you want to say to the people that are still listening? Uh, I appreciate everybody hanging out. This was really fun. And uh, if you want to continue the conversation, I'm on Twitter at GTLeak. Hit me up. Oh, okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.